Thanks for joining us for this week's lesson at Feather Sound Church as we continue in God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Bible, turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is the theme for the book of Acts. And I'm going to read it to you. And this is one verse, and that's all we're covering today because there is so much here packed in. And it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It says you will receive dunamis power, dynamite, explosive power. And it only comes when the Holy Spirit is epi upon you. The Greek word epi comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Judea, the areas that are most similar to you, those are the the St. Pete, Clearwater, Tampa, Judea, the Florida, the Samaria, and I joked around last class, or last uh, message, that Samaria is kind of like those that are similar to you, but a little different, and I compared it to those who who vote, who wrote, root for Alabama and LSU and Clemson and stuff in particular, I'm just kidding. Similar but different. Maybe emphasize the different part, right? No, I'm just kidding. These are people like maybe that are near to you, Mexico with some Western background or things like that. The uttermost parts of the earth, those are the areas that are the end, the unreached, the, the Kurdish people, the people that don't have access to the gospel. And what this is here is this is just a repackaging of the Great Commission. Now, to me, Having spent four years on the mission field and then spending 14 years as a missions pastor, this is a beach ball home run verse. In fact, I told Doug when he preached last week, I said, look, I'm begging you. Go verse 3 to the first half of chapter uh, 1 verse 8a and just give me that last half of it. And so I was excited because here I've got all these resources and experiences. And I'm going, man, we're going to walk and we're going to start at the first mention of the gospel after man's sins in Genesis 3.15. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to walk through the Psalms and the Proverbs and show how they got it. And this is this calling that the people of Israel were called to but just didn't do it. I'm going to walk through Luke chapter 4 and how they just despised Gentiles but that was their calling. And I'm going to provide all these anecdotes and these stories and you'd be in tears and everyone would be happy at the end and we'll all go off and be missionaries. I'm using her hyperbole, but again, like I said, this is something that's really right within my passion and my experience. And the message was largely done and the Lord did a kind of a U-turn in terms of conviction. Speaking to my heart, saying you need to go in a different direction. I don't want you to emphasize that second part. Because if you just speak on that second part, it'll never get done if you don't help them understand the dunamis, the power part, on how to get it done. And so that's where we're going to kind of emphasize here this morning. Now, Acts is volume two of a two-volume work by a guy named Luke. And Luke is writing to this Roman official named Theophilus, lover of God, and and, and this is a message in many ways to all of us who are lovers of God. And in volume 1 at the end, the last chapter, volume or Luke 24, he repeats three things in particular with Acts chapter 1. It's a 40-day overlap from the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension. And in that time, Jesus really wanted us to know three things. And Luke in volume 1 and 2, over those two chapters, emphasizes those three things. And the first thing is, is Jesus spent his time in that 40-day period of time before the uh, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit being poured out. He says, this is what I want you to understand. I want you to understand what my kingdom is. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. They're synonymous terms. And what it is, is a process of God becoming king over hearts and men. It's not a political kingdom like the Roman Empire, which they all made a mistake believing it was. It's a matter of God ruling over hearts instead of man ruling over his own hearts individually. And that expanding to those in concentric circles around you, reaching your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, And the ends of the earth, this process of kingdom expansion. 
starting in Jerusalem with those nearest to you. The second thing that they overlap and he speaks of is, he says you're to be a witness, a testimony. That God has done something in your life and you're to be a witness of what Jesus did and how he changed your life. And the third thing that he wants us to understand and they emphasize in Acts and Luke is that you have to wait for the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit. Why that was important is because they understood who the Holy Spirit was, but typically the Holy Spirit coming out in a powerful way he was obviously always there, but coming out in a powerful way was typically when God came upon Samson in a moment or a specific person, a king, in a moment for a specific task and a specific season. There's something revolutionary that's about to happen 10 days later on the day of Pentecost. And he wants us to be prepared for that, to be equipped for the work that he calls us to. In Luke chapter 24, the end of volume 1, it says they were in the temple praising and worshiping God. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not natural. Natural things is to go off and do other things that are self-oriented. But what he's speaking of is not just the Holy Spirit working around us. He's, he's speaking specifically of something even more radical to do that great commission that Acts 1.8, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. Over this series of time that we're going to be in the book of Acts, we're going to spend a lot of time speaking about the Holy Spirit. I mentioned this morning that I grew up in a very, very, very traditional, legalistic, I would call it. It was devoid of the gospel. I understood that God was angry at sin, that he wanted to squish me because of it. And that's the context I grew up in. It was not life-giving. I wanted nothing to do with God. I was scared of him. And through a series of events, when I went to high school, uh, we went to a Baptist church. And it was in that context that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was revealed to me. And that I was introduced into a relationship of what it was like to know Jesus. And I love my Baptist roots in terms of that's where we camped out. But we never, ever talked about the Holy Spirit, the third person in the three-person trinity. And it was almost like they were afraid or we were afraid to ever speak it about the Holy Spirit in case we might slip up and speak in tongues or something like that. I don't know. And, and we never, ever talked about the Holy Spirit. But the Bible's so full of it. So full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says that if you can't do the calling that you're called to do as a New Testament Christian... Without his empowering. Now, to help us understand, here's a foundation for how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit primarily works in three ways. And in there, if you study the Greek language and you understand, there's often three different words to use the three different actions of the Holy Spirit. The first one is para. Para. It means with. In the sense that God is the Holy Spirit. There's three persons in one essence. I don't fully understand it. I'll never probably understand it till the day I meet him face to face. There's three distinct personalities, but one being they're interdependent. They don't operate separately in terms of, I'm just going to go do my own thing. And so the Holy Spirit is God. God is omniscient. He's all knowing. The Holy Spirit is omniscient. God is also omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. You can't just hide in the corner, do your thing, and say, I'm really pulling one over on the Holy Spirit. No, he knows what's going on. And so he's omniscient. So the sense from the beginning of time that the Holy Spirit has been parta. He has been working with and around us. Whether you're in a pagan culture before you even knew the Lord, or you're off in the Kurdish region, or whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is still there, and he's still working. And how we experience that and his job, he's a gentleman. He doesn't force anyone to do anything. Now, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But typically, generally, um, he will not force you to do something you don't want to do. And this is how the Holy Spirit works, is he's wooing. He's convicting. And, and he's drawing people to himself. In fact, the word says that no man can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him. And he does that gently. He doesn't force you. Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. No. He's going, look, I know that you went out last night 
and you did your thing, and it was fun at the moment, but I've got something better for you. Come to me. I'm wooing you towards something better, where he's convicting you. You've got the, like I had the background of knowing God and, and growing up, but there were all kinds of things that weren't honoring to the Lord, and he's convicting and pulling me towards himself. And so he's convicting. Don't do that. That's going to bring you ruin. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit. And so here's what, what our role is as humans. Our role is don't resist him. You can resist the work of the Holy Spirit if you want. Because in general, again, he's acting as a gentleman. He's not forcing you. And so we can take a role. And just like the calluses on your hands, you can harden your heart. And I would implore you, don't harden your heart. Oh, I'm going to strong arm you. I'm not going to listen. And, and what happens is when there's the wooing that happens in your heart. And you say no. And you say no. And you say no. Eventually the Holy Spirit says, fine, have it your way. He's the hound of heaven, and he's going to hunt you down, but he's not typically going to force you into that relationship. And so you have the Holy Spirit who works para, around, and is working always. Don't resist him. The second thing is indwelling. Indwelling. If you speak Spanish, the word, I want to, quiero vivir en una casa. En una casa, E-N. I want to live in a house. E-N is the word for in. We get English very similar. It comes from the Greek. The Greek word is in. And so one of the roles of the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit that you typically see is that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you finally say, you look at, I, there's enough evidence for me to take a step of faith. I'm done doing it my way, God. I'm going to take you into, I'm going to accept that free gift that you're holding out for me. What happens is now the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes E-N. It dwells in you. And he comes and fills you. And the Bible, 12 times in the Bible, it says that he acts as a seal. In other areas of the Bible, it says it acts as a guarantee. Paul calls it a deposit. Guarantee that you belong to Christ. In other words, once, if you have truly given your life to the Lord, and some people just see the 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 prayer that we do, the Romans 10, 9 kind of prayer is a get out of jail free kind of card and they pray that. They don't really mean it. They see it as magic words. If you see it as something, as a declaration of sincere faith, the Bible is clear. It's not a matter of when saved, always saved. If you really are saved, you will truly be kept because the Holy Spirit is put in your life as a deposit guaranteeing. And there's nothing that you and I can do to remove and kick out the Holy Spirit. Now that's a beautiful thought. It's not dependent on your ability to be saved by your actions, nor is it a dependent on your ability to maintain your salvation. It's a free gift of grace that you receive, and it is also a gift of grace that God maintains you. It doesn't remove you from your responsibility. That's another message for another day. I'm just telling you what the Bible says over and over and over, that the Holy Spirit's job is to act as a stamp. I belong to Jesus Christ. I have a friend who returned a water bottle I lost, and my name is written on it. You know, I, it belongs to me. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in his indwelling and in giving you the heart of Jesus. And our job is to receive him. If you've never received Jesus and he's wooing and convicting you right now, and right now you go, I don't even know why I'm here. A friend of mine invited me. I don't know what I'm even doing. I've been here for three weeks. I just feel compelled. Or you know what? This is the third time this week that someone has said the same message to me. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come, come, don't resist me. Your job is not to resist him. Your job is now to receive him. By faith, I think there's enough evidence I'm going to receive you. And the third work of the Holy Spirit is typically, you see in the New Testament, this Greek word epi, epi. It means upon. It's the filling, sometimes you see it, this filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit upon you. And you've heard me say it before, the famous theologian, D.L. Moody, he says, lady says, why do I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? He says, man, that's because we leak. And I'll explain why we leak. And why we're leaky vessels later on. 
But the word epi, to come upon, sometimes happens at the same moment that you receive Jesus. The epi and the en happen simultaneously. You see that in the book of Acts as I study, Acts chapter 10, you have this fellow by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He's a Roman leader, not typically a, a God-fearer, but here's this guy who was a God-fearer. He's living on the west coast of Israel, and uh, he's got a bunch of people around. It said he was a good man, he was a generous man. And it was revealed to him to go and call a guy named Peter, uh, who's staying at the home of Simon the Tanner. And Simon the Tanner lives just north in, in Joppa, and he calls this guy and he brings him, but Peter just had a dream and God speaks to him and says, Simon, don't call what I have made clean, unclean. And this guy knocks at his door and he's like, whoa, I never would go to a Gentile's home, but Jesus just showed me that I shouldn't call unclean what is God has made clean. And so he goes to their home, these Gentiles, and he explains who Jesus is as the Messiah. And they accept him as Lord and Savior of their life. They receive that free gift of salvation, taking their sin debt, placing it on Jesus, and Jesus placing his righteousness on them is what it means. But the epi and the end happened simultaneously. The Holy Spirit indwelt them and came upon them at the same time. However, as you walk through the book of Acts, a lot of times you see it working as a subsequent work. Holy Spirit coming in. And then this epi action of filling coming later on. Example, Paul. Paul in Acts chapter 9, he's on the road to Damascus. He's the main persecutor, enemy number one of Christians. And he's going down this road and a bright light appears and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. What would you have me do, Lord? The right answer, by the way. When this big light blinds you and he asks you, what would you have me do? Most scholars believe at that moment when he calls him Lord, he has confessed, okay, Jesus, the one I'm persecuting, you're definitely Lord. And yet it's not till later that he goes to the street called Straight. And Ananias in great fear comes to him and lays hands and prays and he receives the epi filling of the Holy Spirit. And all, we all know what happened in Paul's life and how he was indwelt and filled to do tremendous missionary, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth kind of work. One chapter before that, chapter 8, you have the Samaritans. They were despised because they were half-breed Jews. And they had all kinds of mixtures of syncretism of their faith. And the apostles in Jerusalem hear that just down the road, the Samaritans, those slightly different than them but similar, had received Jesus as the Messiah. The Samaritan woman, things like that happened obviously earlier. And so what happens is they dispatch Peter and John to go there. So these people already received Jesus as the Messiah. The Holy Spirit is E-N in their life. And they lay hands on them and they receive the epi-filling of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you one other example. There's a great guy in Acts chapter 18. His name's Apollos. He's from Alexandria. He's a theologian. He was, it says he was mighty in speech and in power. He knew the ways of the Lord and he explained the gospel well to them. And so the Ephesian church becomes and declares faith in Jesus Christ. A couple named Priscilla and Aquila are there. They spent time with Paul. They, were, they knew and understood the gospel and they take Apollos to the side. They explain the gospel a little fuller. He goes off and he's a traveling missionary. Sometime later, Paul shows up and says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, well, we've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he lays hands upon them, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and fills them in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. And so I just wanted to paint a picture as this victorious Christian living happens as the Holy Spirit does his work in us. Now, why does this need to happen? It must be absolutely clear amongst us this needs to happen is because what we are called to do to reach and be as witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth only happens by spiritual power because it's spiritual work. It is not natural work. It is only by the Holy Spirit that lives are going to be convicted and changed. 
There is such a great burden if we ever put that upon ourselves and we say, man, i got to go out and evangelize and it's up to me. No, it's not up to us. It's up to the Holy Spirit to do that work. We're nothing more than an instrument, a vessel for that. Paul tells the church in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine, their natural tendency, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, it's a very precise language. And what the word means, it's present progressive. So it's be filled, and it's, it, it would be awkward if we worded it this way, but the real translation would be be filled and keep on being filled. It's something that happens but is continually happening, happening to be happened. That's why D.L. Moody, Moody can say, I leak, and I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because of Acts chapter 5, verse 18. So the natural question that you have right now, okay, I understand why, well, then how in the world does this happen? Good question. It's very simple. The, the principle is just simply, the Holy Spirit cannot be in control of my life typically if I maintain control of my life. It's a simple process of surrender. Emptying yourself of self. Emptying so that you can be filled. And it typically happens through obedience. There's no magic prayer, fill me, Holy Spirit, fill us. No, the Holy Spirit's already here. But he's not going to enter a vo an area that is filled with something else. Paul says in Colossians 1.29, he says, for this I toil, the word toil, obviously work hard. And then he goes and says, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully supplies me, that he works within me. I really believe what, what here he's trying to say is that the Holy Spirit is para, working around us. Our job is not to resist him, that he's working and he comes in us. Our job is to receive him. But the third point of what I said, that he is epi, can come upon us. Our job is to participate with him. I want to participate with you. And that's what Paul says, Colossians 1.29. He says, I'm going to toil. I'm going to work my tail off. But I recognize it's your power working. And I'm going to struggle. And I'm going to be working with that. Not out of motive of duty, but out of motive of love. And so the book of Acts revolves around this verse. It's how that great commission happened that we see in action in regular people. And it's a standalone message because you and I need this absolutely clearly in order to how to do this message that we have clearly been called to do to expand his kingdom. His Matthew 28 commission of going ye therefore into all nations, teaching them, baptizing them, expanding the kingdom of God in hearts and minds of those around you in those concentric circles to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Acts 1-8, amplified, I guess you could say, Jesus says, he says, all authority has been given to me. He's basically saying, and I'm giving it to you. The Greek word for authority is exousia. Exousia is delegated power, delegated authority. And he's saying, look, I've been delegated this authority from God. Now I'm delegating and I'm giving it to you. And now I want you to go and do this commission that I'm calling you to do. And I'm going to give you power to do it. A different type of power. Dunamis power. Dynamite. Explosive power to do it. And I was thinking on how I could communicate this in a way that maybe receives something that's a little near and dear to my heart. And it hurts a little bit. But I'm going to be bold to share it. Last summer I contracted a solar company to go and Put solar panels on my roof. I want to be green. I want to save money. And I plan on, Lord willing, being in the house for a while. And I like the idea of not having a power bill. And uh, <clears throat> I contracted a company that had been around for a little while and didn't have any warning signs or anything like that. And I signed a piece of paper um, that gave them delegated authority to work on my house and pull a permit on my behalf. That's exousia. I have given you the power now to go and do this renovation work on my house. So they go to the county because apparently the county and most homeowners don't like it when random people come and start building on their house. And so I give the delegated authority that only I as the homeowner can give. And then they were supposed to take their dunamis, their ability, skill, experience, 
materials and go do the work on my house. Except for the problem was, is they went bankrupt a couple weeks ago with my deposit. And, uh, not happy. I'm getting this out right now, okay? We're working this out together. <laughs> Here's the point, how I'm redeeming this story, is they had exousia. They had exousia, delegated authority to do the job. What they were lacking in was dunamis, the ability, the power to fulfill their exousia. And I believe that's exactly what is happening largely in the church today. Is that we're walking around with exousia that's clearly delegated to us, but we don't have the dunamis to be able to fulfill that great commission. We're trying because I know we're supposed to do it, and we're very unsuccessful and ineffective doing it. Show this picture, Rose, on the, the thing. I think this kind of draws home the point as well. Um, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, uh, Royal Caribbean has a cruise ship that's 205,000 tons. It is massive, 5,500 people on board with 4,000 employees, 9, 000, over 9,000 people on board. Here's one of the power plants that go into it. It's a diesel electric generator or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> look at the size of it compared to that ship. That is a big, can you imagine throwing that in your Honda? Now, the Port Authority of Miami has given Carnival, uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines exousia. They've given them the delegated authority to park at their dock and take and contract for people to come on the boat and enjoy a Caribbean vacation. It's delegated authority. You know, they even have a massive power plant that goes in the ship. But that ship is just going to sit there at the dock. It's never going to go anywhere unless it has the fuel, the dunamis. You can have all the things in place. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when this epi ability comes upon us. To do what? Well, he goes and he says, to be my witnesses of my kingdom. God's kingdom is just a matter of God's kingdom becoming king over our hearts, as I mentioned before, in this process of expanding, to move away from human brokenness towards God's plan. We as a church believe in this message and are giving that through your tithes and offerings, we continue to increase our percentage of our giving. And we see this, and we have an investment in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and we're making a very concerted effort that a big proportion of our giving is going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. We're not going to miss that part of the Great Commission. And that's why we're praying about the Kurds and how God might open the door for us to be involved with them. In 1882, one of the founders of a, the massive student volunteer movement, A.T. Pearson, he wrote that three things were needed to finish Acts 1-8 and evangelize the world. He said the first thing is that the whole church needs to be involved. Now, he recognized that most missionary movements came out of young people giving their lives to the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. But he purposely wanted the church to know that these aren't going to happen alone. That we all have a responsibility to pray, to send, to give our lives as an opportunity here in our Jerusalem or Judea and just to be available and he wanted to know the church, it wasn't just the Apostle Pauls that are supposed to go out, but we have a role that we should take seriously. And he said, he said it's not optional to be his witnesses. I couldn't help but think, what does a witness do? And I mentioned it two weeks ago. A witness is a person who testifies to what they've seen and experienced in their life. And so I went online and I looked up what happens if a witness is called before a court of law and refuses to testify. And you know what it says? Penal Code 166 says he will be held in contempt of court. Usually it results in jail time or a fine. Aren't you glad that our salvation is based on the fact that we receive Jesus and not whether or not we share our faith? We don't go to jail. Oh, you didn't share your faith You're for six weeks. You're going to jail. Spend some time there. We're going to fine you. It's not based on that, but it's a serious business that we need to understand that he's called us to be his witnesses. The correlation, I think, right here is that there is a, we do ourselves a disservice when we don't testify. We don't lose our salvation, but I tell you what we do lose. I think we lose power. 
and we lose influence, and we lose victory in our life as a Christian. Pearson also said that the power of the Holy Spirit was needed. He said the church has money, brains, organizations, rivers of prayer, and oceans of sermon, but she lacks in power. And I couldn't help but think of what I had read years ago. It said if the first century church had the Holy Spirit removed, 90% of the work would stop. If the current church in North America had the Holy Spirit removed, 90% of the work would continue because it's just not spiritual. It's just effort. It just shows how much we need this dunamis. So here's the three things on why we need the Holy Spirit to do Acts 1-8 kingdom expansion. The ABCs, one, addition. Addition. Acts 11-24 says that Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a large company was added to the Lord. If you want your life to have an, a large company added to it, it's only when the Holy Spirit works in individuals bringing the kingdom of God in boldness as a, te- as a testimony. I couldn't help but think, you know, a scalpel, it's an instrument, and it can never sit there after a great surgery and say, man, what an awesome scalpel I am. Look at the work I just, look at the tumor over there. I did that. I cut that out. I saved that person's life. Now, you know what a, 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 a scalpel's job is? A scalpel's job is to stay sharp because the surgeon is using that. And using his skill, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to, to stay sharp. I think that's why in Colossians 1.29, Paul says, he says, I toil, struggling, so that his work, his power might be effectual in me. It might work in me. Keeping himself sharp, participating with what God wants to do, results in addition. The B is boldness. Pearson said the third point. He said three things are needed. The third point is there needs to be a zeal to evangelize. And I couldn't help but think, you know, what's never going to happen is right now you're like, third point, a need to evangelize, a zeal. Man, I suddenly have a zeal. Just because of you saying that. I believe it. It's just not going to happen that way. It has to happen when we surrender to the Holy Spirit and make ourselves available. Doug, one of our leaders, um, he, he preached last week and he relegated a story. He told a story about how when he was in northern India a couple weeks ago and he's with this guy who is a modern apostle Paul and all these churches that he's planted and the context is Hinduism and, and he says, brother, pray for me. I feel like I've become lazy. I've only shared Christ with 100 people this month. Normally it's 200 Pray for me, I'm lazy. And what you don't understand is the context of Hinduism is that in Hin- India today, there's a pro-Hindu government. You go to jail, and there's anti-conversion laws. At best, you go to jail, you might get the tar beat out of you. You might be killed for your faith. I honestly can't say that here. And here's this guy who boldly goes, and there's a reason that all these amazing things are happening around this fella in India. But I'm so convicted, last week I... Had the opportunity, one of my buddies, big birthday, the big 5 and he says, get out here and I'll pay for your expenses. I got six guys and we're going to go snowmobiling and skiing. And I got a $70 Frontier Airline ticket. And because it was $70, I had to fly home at midnight on Sunday. And I get there at 9 o'clock. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm going home. Ditches me at the airport. And I got hours to kill. And so... All I want to do in my flesh is sit down and watch cat videos or something like that, you know, pull out Netflix and shut my brain off for a couple hours. But I had packed a bunch of tracks, and I got to confess, I know you should think better of me than this, but the last thing in the world I want to do is hand out tracks, honestly. Um, I don't like rejection, things like that, but I brought these along to challenge myself if they're there. And I start walking through the airport, trying not to get kicked out, and I'm trying to ask the Holy Spirit, would you show me who needs to have this? And I wasn't totally successful because I got strong-armed a few times. Get out of here, you crazy weirdo. And I'm handing these off to people, and, uh, and I didn't have a single really deep spiritual conversation that night. I finished my pack off, got to my cat videos. No. Um, but let me tell you something that happened. By just taking a step of faith towards boldness, being a, taking a step of faith towards being a testimony, a witness, I had the most incredible 
spiritual week that I had probably had at least in at least a year. I had at least eight conversations about the gospel, deep theological conversations that were natural with people, that weren't weird at all, that flowed out this week with people that don't attend church and have never confessed Jesus as Lord in their, of their life. And it was so radically different from the bubble I'm normally in that I'm starting to think, what in the world, why did this happen? And all I could think of is, it was this, the Holy Spirit moving because of the boldness of taking a step of faith forward. I read an article about the Christians in Wuhan where the coronavirus is breaking out and how they're wearing these masks and at risk of their own life and contracting their disease, they're meeting the needs of these people that have contracted, bringing food and hope to these people. And it got me wondering, and I started researching and looking at the great expansions of Christianity over the years in the 150s, the 250s, in the 300s, during the bubonic plague, all these different plagues and pandemics throughout history. And you know what happened? The church growth exploded because Christians in boldness went and loved on people and shared the hope that they had because of who Jesus was. The emperor Julian in the 4th century says, I don't understand these Christians. They, he called them pagans because they didn't follow the pagan Roman religions. I don't understand them. They take care of their poor and our poor. Tried to instruct the pagan priests to do the same and it was never successful. Why? Because the motive was different. A heart of love, not a heart of duty. Over and over, the free range of Burmas. You know, some people go for glory and honor, but every soldier is paid. These guys raise money to do stuff like this. They go in there because of love of Christ. And they go into conflict situations. They run towards it. There was an article I read about the Ebola breakout. And this secular fellow, it was in Christianity Today, I think it was. And this one guy said, I don't understand Christians. He's an unbeliever. He says they seem to run towards danger. Speaking of the Christians that responded to the Ebola I don't understand it. He goes, it's supposed to be our job, the government's job to deal with this. And yet these people are doing it. The boldness. And it seems that when we take a step of faith of boldness, the Holy Spirit does a work. The last point, the C, is conviction. To do and to act. It's very similar. It's not natural. But conviction to be bold to result in addition only happens when we're convinced of the truth, when it's a reality in our life. Have you ever felt, and I felt this way many times, have you ever felt that something's missing in your life? You're like, I believe I'm fully convinced that Jesus really was a historical figure, died on the cross, paid my debt, my penalty. But I feel like there is something missing. I wouldn't trade my faith for anything, but I feel like there is a power that I'm missing. I'm not asking for hands to go up, but I'm telling you, you know what it is? It's this dunamis. It's this missing of this dynamite Holy Spirit filling ep, uh, epi upon yourself. Now, there's two things in particular, primary things, that quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that we can quench, that we can put out the Holy Spirit, that we can block the Holy Spirit from moving in our life. And here I just want to share them with you before we get into song and finish. Is unconfessed sin. Psalm 51, David says, after Bathsheba incident, he says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, you would not have heard me. I read Psalm 32 when people were coming in, talking about the power of immediate repentance. On how that wall is torn down and that relationship is immediately restored. And in that psalm, he, be he virtually begs you, don't. When the floods are coming, don't harden your heart. Unconfessed sin. Don't offer your bodies to sin. Unconfessed sin, just for my definition purpose here, is, is doing something that he says is wrong. It's active sin. Don't do it, and I'm doing it. And here's three things that I think that are, that are really applicable. I'm not naming names here, but in general to our culture. How we treat our spouse. Guys in particular, guys, 1 Peter 3 says, husbands, treat your wives. And he tells us how to treat, treat her gently, treat her carefully as fellow heirs. To treat and to love your wife well. Look, at I'm telling you right now, there is 
a power that you're missing on simply because you are not treating your wife with understanding. I think the principle goes both ways. Spouse, that's why I said it's spouse. But in particular, guys, repent of that. Ask the Lord to change your heart towards your spouse. The second thing is distorted loves. There's all kinds of things that we do. And God is supposed to be on the love, on the throne of our life. And we distort with good things. And we make them ultimate things. In Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower, it says that these certain things, they grow up. And that they get choked out by the cares of the world. The American dream. Oh, I, all these different things that I'm accumulating and accumulating. And they fill your life so that they're so full of these things that you have no room for the Holy Spirit to act and move and to have freedom to work in our lives. I'm guilty of it. I'll confess it before you today. But I'm telling you the third thing that I'm really guilty of, that most of us are guilty of, is pride and being self-centered. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And this includes sometimes doing good things with wrong motives. I'm going into a situation, I'm doing all these good things, I'm trying to please that person, but the wrong motive is just self-centered because it makes me feel good, it's easier for me to do this, it gets me out of this situation. It's a self-centeredness. Pride a lot of times. Sometimes it's just outright pride. I'm, I want to do this because I want to feel special. I, I'm better than everyone else. And it's a surefire way out of all of them to prevent the Holy Spirit from really epifilling you and moving and giving you victory in life. Now, the opposite side of the coin, not just doing something he says is wrong, but the second thing is disobedience. It's passive. It's not doing something he says is right. And Acts 1.8 is that. He's called us as a command, not an option, to be as witnesses, to go into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. To go, as Matthew 28 says, to go, and the word is present progressive. It's going while you're going, while you're at work, while you're with your boss, while you're with your neighbor, while you're doing your life and living your life, you're to be my witnesses and going to all those areas. Now, I'm going to call the worship team up, but the remedy for all these things, to emptying yourself, to having a vessel that the Holy Spirit can move in dunamis is very simple. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a matter of simply surrendering and emptying yourself. God, here's my sin. I'm going to confess it. Lord, would you reveal, we started off with doing communion because I wanted our hearts to be prepared for a message that only the Holy Spirit could do in our life, to be emptied, to be full, to be filled. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something, maybe you don't have to, it's not a requirement, but what I've often said and often found is that when you take a step of boldness, a step of faith, with a simple action, it gives the Holy Spirit more room to operate in your life. I remember the first time I went forward to the front of the church, what we call the altar, and got on my knees and confessed. It was freeing. It was almost like by that act of saying, I don't care what other people have to think. And no one's thinking that, by the way. You know, the beautiful thing is, is you think, what do all the people think about me? Well, the truth is they're really not thinking about you. And so I come up before, and I don't care what people think. I just care about the Holy Spirit being in my life. And I want to invite you to do business, in particularly those three areas, that, that disobedience, the unconfessed sin, the way I've been treating my wife, maybe the pride and self-centeredness in my life, the things that are blocking and preventing the Holy Spirit from moving, maybe even coming and confessing my disobedience in terms of the active involvement I should have or the passive involvement I have. I want to invite you while we do the last two songs to come and, come and use the altar. But I'm also going to have some of our leaders, and Debbie is going to be up here up front, um, Bruce and Nancy. If you would like and you feel like you've done the work during the song to have Bruce and Nancy or Debbie pray over you for the epi-filling of the Holy Spirit, they're available right here. Uh, Rob is going to be, and Carol are going to be up here praying for people who feel called to serve in Jerusalem and Judea.
Um, Tim and myself will be over here. Those people who need someone to talk to aren't comfortable doing it right here, but want someone to come and minister to them over their repentance and the things that are going on in their life. Or, and then Brother Doug's going to be over there calling for those who feel a call to cross-cultural missions or ministry or maybe just want to be available to whatever God might have from. You can go to anybody for any reason if you feel comfortable, but I'm just offering that. I'm leaving that out there. One of the things and the roles that I have here is as lead pastor, there is nothing in and of myself that's any different other than there is an exousia that has been given by you, the church membership, and the Lord to be the delegated shepherd of this church. And I take it seriously that I just don't want to leave people that are not changed and that come here and say, man, I enjoyed the worship and want those stained glass nice and I feel like I've done my religious duty. But to beg and to plead that God has something more for you as an individual, a power and a joy and the fruit of the Spirit that you never thought possible. And I'm starting to get excited about it because I'm telling you as a witness, a testimony of how God has operated in my life and the enthusiasm that I have because of what God has done. So let's stand together and we're going to worship. But as that exousia delegated authority as shepherd of this church, I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as I've done the work personally, and I know I'm not perfect, but I've prayed that you would move in power, knowing that it is your work. I pray, God, that you would do that in the lives and the hearts of those that are attending second service here today. So many people came forward for prayer in the morning. I pray, God, that you would duplicate that, that you would impact our hearts and change us. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Acts example. We pray that we would be faithful and that we would turn this county, this state, this country, and this world upside down for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about our church, you can check us out simply by going online to feathersoundchurch.com.